Determination. Is there a primary trait for determination? Yes. Yes. What is it? Y, G, long strokes. Um, even in the end of the name, like Bart, you had a long extender. Okay? But if you don't have that, you can still be determined, right? It would be persistence plus willpower. I think persistent determination seem to be interchangeable in my mind. So if you put persistence with a number of traits, you would probably have that. I'd say persistence plus high self-esteem. You think that might be willpower? Right, Dan? Yes. That's another combination. You get a bonus. Who likes three bonuses? Okay. So you can make these up on your own. I don't think you've been given permission to make them up. I'm giving you permission. Start thinking outside the box. Be self-determined. This equals that. And uh, one of the one of the ways that I analyze handwriting and do written reports is I ask myself, well, I see that they have this in the handwriting. I see they have persistence in the handwriting. I ask myself, is there any other trait that would help this person become successful? And by asking that question, my mind starts to scan for answers to that specific question. So if you don't ask the question, you're, you may not pick it up. So if I say, is there anything about this handwriting that would make me not trust this person? And then I scan, and I go, oh, well, there's a loop. There's muddy writing. Hmm. I can't read his hand. I can't read his signature. Well, okay. All of these alone may not be really big red flags. But if I don't ask the right question, my mind can't scan for the right information. Does that, does that make sense for you? Yes. Okay. There's a part of the brain called the reticular activator system. How many of you have read the book called Success Secrets of the Rich and Happy? Okay, excellent. There's actually a section called RAS, reticular activator system, and it's about how your mind sorts information. And, and it's, so, it's so amazing because it's a process that I think people look at and go, oh, that's neat. But it's a process that if you use it, you can change your whole life. You can change your income, you can change everything. Because you'll start to look, you'll start to recognize things that you absolutely did not see before. And one of the ways to do this in handwriting is to ask specific questions and then let your unconscious mind kind of scan for you. Because just by listing the traits, you may never get to, is this person a criminal? Is this person a good person? When I do live analysis, I really don't like doing written analysis without talking to the person. Because I like to have a frame, like a context for is this a relationship, is this business, are you thinking about marrying him, is this your daughter, like there's just so many different contexts and that frame will dictate the words I choose and the analogies and metaphors. So it's useful to talk. I prefer when they pay me, I think my fee is $350 for a half hour to do an analysis. I think they get more benefit from talking to me because I can interact with them. I can ask them what they're looking for. They can tell me their biggest problem, and I can scan for a solution to that problem. If I don't talk to them, I may be scanning for what's the best relationship, and this person's been married for 30 years, and I just spend a lot of time on information that doesn't matter. So I like doing that. Uh, you probably will end up doing a lot of written reports as well. But I always like to find out what the biggest problem is, what's the biggest challenge, because I can tailor my reports better. And in America, it's pretty common to do telephone meetings and coaching, we do by telephone. So a lot of coaches have meetings five times a day by telephone. And sometimes they record or sometimes they don't. But it means that there's no commuting. And so that's very effective. Uh, it's very effective for the first meeting to be in person, because you can read their body language and you can get some rapport. Rapport. I'll, I'll speak Indian. So it's very effective. But telephone is good too. And then secondly, what I do in, is we just record the meeting and then I send the MP3 file to the customer. And they can listen to it over and over. You can also have it transcribed. Um, I, I, I value my time, and so if I can record it, have it transcribed, have my system edited roughly, and then they get a verbal and a transcript. And that makes them pretty happy. It takes me probably two and a half hours to do a written report that took me half an hour to do on the telephone. So for me, I'd rather do a verbal analysis. 
But some people, like HR people, need written. Later today, we're going to talk about how to do a written report, and I'll show you an actual report. I did change the name, by the way, and I did include the handwriting for privacy. But this guy paid me $650 for a written report, and I still felt that I was underpaid because I spent almost three hours on it. Annoying. Grudge bearer. That's me. I'm holding a grudge. I didn't get paid enough. Is there a primary stroke for a grudge bearer? There is. What is it? Heavy writing. So heavy writing is emotional intensity, right? A metaphor for emotional intensity is you probably hold a grudge. Okay. So you're kind of right and kind of not right. So as a primary trait, there's not a primary trait. But there is a similar trait, which is heavy writer. And notice that on the very first slide, the most important thing is you have a heavy pin pressure, right? So it's so you're right on the money. It's just that that's one metaphor. So you're going to be more accurate now, because some people would say, well, I have heavy handwriting, but I don't hold the grudge. Yes, but you have colors and sensitive, and you're packing up. But do they have sensitive criticism, and do they have big whys? That's the piece that may be specific to holding a grudge. It's a good answer, by the way. Thank you for this video. So heavy pen pressure we know, but do they have sensitive criticism because then they're going to get hurt and re-hurt and that wound is going to open and open. Strong imagination. Again, the bigger imagination, the more they're going to imagine people harming them. The more they're going to imagine and replay the picture in their head of what they did wrong. So the bigger imagination, whether it's a Y or an H, they're going to keep imagining. Okay. The reason that big Y is related to sex drive is people have to have imagination. They will, what can I do? This is a romance. Oh my God, you should bring me flowers. All that's imagination. And it's normally a good thing, especially in artistic. Is there a primary stroke for this trait called jealousy? Yes. Yes, it is a tight beginning, right? How many of you have seen jealousy but not in the handwriting? You know someone that's jealous, but it's not in the handwriting. Right? That's pretty common. Okay. Well, here's one of the reasons why. Because even if you don't have a primary trait, if you have resentment plus acquisitiveness, you have jealousy. And I would say resentment breeds most of the negative traits we're going to talk about today. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Big, big deal. Resentment. Incompatibility. I'm sure you've been asked somebody, are you compatible? So I take two glasses of water. And... Um, I mix them together. Two, two glasses of water, one water, right? If I take two glasses of water, and one of them has got really, really dirty water with all kinds of bacteria and chemicals, and I mix them together, what's the new water? <laughs> it's corrupted, right? So if you take a really good woman and a man with resentment and mix them together, what's the relationship going to be like? It's corrupted. So any of the two partners, if they have resentment, will corrupt a good person. So compatibility is important, but if one individual has hostility, resentment, any of these negative uh, hostile traits, the entire relationship will be, will be difficult. And so the advice to the person that does not have the resentment is, you're going to have an ongoing problem as long as this person doesn't change. And it's difficult to ask someone to change if they don't want to change. If someone says, hey, I'm still pissed off because something happened when I was 12, I would like some help, that person has a good chance of changing. But if the wife is your customer or your client and she says, well, my husband is a jerk, you have a problem. Because you can't change him because he's not in the session. She can only capitulate and kind of work around it. Acquisitiveness, which is similar to jealousy, right? Desire to acquire. So they resent something the other person has, which is essentially what jealousy is. We think of jealousy in the, per, in the context of love, but it's also in the context of material things. Or status. Status, right? I wish I was important. I wish... Um, I had a student of mine, I don't even know if he was a student, I know he, he, he bought one book. He actually published a book with the exact same cover as my relationship book, and a very similar name. Like, it was identical color, similar model, similar name. And I was like, wow, I guess I should be flattered, or should I be mad? I wasn't sure. <laughs> and what was funny about that is, I remember the first book, which was a, 
Hand Analysis for a Love Sex Relationship. The original title was Secrets of Making Love Happen. And the original title had a very pretty girl on the cover, a, a white girl with the back of a guy's head. And I was at the first book conference in 1993. You just give me a bit how old I am. Old. <laughs> and this lady who was in the book business said, that's a terrible cover. That cover will never work. You need to change it. And I was like, <laughs> I just spent all this money and time. I thought it was so artistic. And she was right. It wasn't a great cover. I was talking to another woman in the line, and she goes, you know, I'm a lesbian. And I would never read that book. Because <laughs> there's a pretty young girl on it. And I thought, I wonder how many ugly old women would not read that book because there's a pretty girl on it. I was 23. I liked pretty girls. <laughs> That's not your customer, right? So now the book has no photograph on it. Well, this guy copied the old cover and thought he was going to be successful. And that's funny. So he copied the cover that didn't work. Because the book cover did not make the book sell. I made the book sell. Self-interest. Is there a primary trait for self-interest? 